Olá! Esta edição do programa Saúde e Consciência será comandada pelo professor e doutor Odair Alberton. O entrevistado é o professor de Harvard Summer School, Jerry Brightman, que esteve em maio na Unipar com palestras voltadas ao tema liderança. Acompanhe. <música> Everybody, uh, welcome, Jerry. Uh, Thank you. Here in Brazil, everybody is, is excited with you. You came here. Well, I know that you leave your your home, your family, to be one week in uh, here in Paraná at you uh, at Unipar. But we are very glad to be with you here, and we would like to know a little bit about about your life, about your for, uh, formation. How to how did you get here to be here? Yes. Um, please tell, tell me about you a little bit. Well, I, I think I'm very lucky, I say first, because I was born in a very small town uh, south of Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. maybe seven miles long, not even a mile at its widest point. And to think that since then I have traveled to over a hundred countries. Uh, to been through all Central America and most of South America, to be in Brazil for my fourth time, if you had told me when I am a little boy, I would say, you're crazy. <laughs> But I, I think I was lucky. I think my parents did a nice job to instill the value of education, mm -hmm. the importance of education. Mm -hmm. uh, that came first. Even though I think I was a pretty good athlete, <laughs> that comes second. You, the books come first. Okay. And I think that that has helped me um, in my life to get a, an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, a doctorate degree, and then even to teach at university, for me has been a blessing. So I'm very happy and very honored, but most of all, I think very lucky. Uh, everybody needs a little, a little, a little bit of luck. <laughs> a little bit of luck. <laughs> and uh, as you are in Harvard and Tufts University as well, and the, uh, about the research over there, how it works to the research over there to like to see, uh, to be a student there as well, to do research, to, to attend your, your classes. How, uh, could you give some ways to, to do that? Yeah, I think um, the, 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 the universities, I think, in the States, first of all, have to have a certain standard for English. So, mm -hmm. of course, the TOEFL exam, uh, to make sure that they will be able to integrate well in the class has nothing to do so much with your academics, yes. but the English is important. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there have been times in my class that I've said back to the administration, maybe we have to increase the number a little higher. But how, Be, how, is, how higher is this score now to get in? Uh, I don't remember the scale, so okay. I probably will give you the wrong number, but uh -huh. it's, it's competitive with all the universities in and around Massachusetts, like MIT, ah, okay. Harvard, okay. and so forth. Uh -huh. But I think we still have to raise a little bit because hmm. sometimes we talk too fast. Okay. English is a second language to these people. Yes. Uh, and for them to keep up, it's difficult. So uh, I don't mean to be discriminatory and say you can't come mm -hmm. because your English is not as good, mm -hmm. but the English, it would be an asset. Yeah. Then I found uh, in my classes, these people are very modest. I, I ask them what they do, mm -hmm. and they tell me, and I am amazed at what they do. So I'll give you an example. One company, BAE, uh, it's a big global conglomerate. I say, so what do you do? He says, oh, I have, a, I have a, a difficult job. I say, what is your job? I must predict what weapons our enemy will be using against us 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I have to advise my colleagues what defensive mechanisms we need to protect ourselves against those predictions of 10 years. 
Ah, my mouth is dropping. What an amazing job. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's not so bad. I'm thinking, for you, it's not so bad. For me, it sounds like you must be a miracle maker. Mm -hmm. And they're all modest about what they do. And um, I think we just give them coaching to be more confident as they transform from manager to leader. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning, Odair, in many of our courses, they don't even know there's a difference between managing and leading. So that's where we begin mm -hmm. and show that there is a difference. Even though we should all have a little of both, there is a difference. And we want them to transform from engineering managers to engineering leaders. Ah, that's very good. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And OK, so we have to have a good grade of English. I like it off. Or, uh, or also one issue is how much to, to get in there? <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is, I cannot believe that I only have one more child for college. <laughs> Three have already gone through. I know um, the undergraduate tuition at Tufts mm -hmm. is in excess of $60,000 per year. And only a couple of years ago, it was just $50,000 or $52,000. So the inflation of cost to get into a school, very high. Um, quite honestly, my wife and I hope that my daughter uh, when she goes to college in four years, maybe she gets a scholarship because I don't know how, how people do it through mm -hmm. the price of school. Harvard, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, tough $60,000 for undergraduate. It's a lot of money. By the time you're done, a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. For each, huh? For each. So, each. yeah, if you have a cup, it's a half a million dollars. That's uh, right. So, yeah. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, at your class at, at the Harvard Summit School, you teach about the sim system thinking. It's about the organizations and the leadership. Could you tell about, uh, a little bit about, uh, for us, uh, how, is it to, how this is important, is important for, for us, how to change our way to think? So. Yeah, um, there's a very famous quote by Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. He says, the problems that we face today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that existed when the problem began. And the implication there is we have to change our thinking as the problem evolves and gets worse. So we offer systems thinking as one new way to think about the world around you. The difficulty comes because of the fast pace in the United States and in the world, that everything has to be finished and answered yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and systems thinking takes time because you have to figure out what are all the elements that are making up this problem. Mm -hmm. And that takes time, and that is very counterintuitive to the pressure that we feel. So, for example, I use a case, a very simple case about a chair. So let's say your couch. Mm -hmm. And over time, we see in the beginning, sales are going up, revenues are going up, no complaints, and the goods get to the customer quickly. Then I put a line on the chart, and the revenues begin to go down, and mm -hmm. the sales begin, uh, profits go down and the quality problems go up, and delivery problems go up. So I trick my students. Mm -hmm. I say, so what will we do about sales? And they say, ah, we have a good sales uh, training. Good. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the shipping? Well, we teach them different routes and we get GPS. Mm -hmm. What about the quality? Well, we must have a quality program and we do that. So I said, now the problem solved? Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me show you what happened after we do all these. And I show the next part of the graph. Sales are getting worse, revenues are getting worse, quality is getting worse, and delivery is getting worse. How could this be? Because when we think about systems thinking, we think about the interrelationship of all of these factors as one force mm -hmm. that's changing that system in the company. So it turns out that because sales were dri dipping only a little bit, People panicked, and the salespeople promise everything. So this couch you are on is, to my eyes, kind of a brownish gray. Mm -hmm. You say to me, Jerry, I know you only produce that couch, but I want one in red. I say, no problem, red. But do you know how many millions of kinds of red there are? So I have a bright red. Mm -hmm. I give it to the customer. No, 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 this is not what we want. We want slight, I give another one. No, 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 we need, and, and the salespeople, they promise everything because they are fearful that the, they, they will be, we have to find new customers. And the cost of getting a new customer is four times the cost 
of going to an existing customer. So I say, why do you go to a new customer? They are panicking, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. So if you can stop and look at all the elements that impact that system, then you can come up with the leverage to make a good decision. But it takes time, and time is of a premium. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why we try to to make it, uh, to change the way of thinking. Huh? That's uh, exactly. That's, uh, and uh, okay. uh, I, I noticed that you are very excited to be uh, a teacher and a professor. But how you become this? Uh, how you get it that this experience to be a professor and uh, oh, oh, why the inspiration for this? Every year, there is always one student who maybe you have turned around. Maybe they didn't think they would succeed and they succeeded. Maybe they have a poor image of themselves and you are being a, a supporter of them as a teacher and they say, oh, I'm pretty good. And you say, yeah, you're very, very good. And to, to change even one life that way is so gratifying to my soul. Um, if I'm lucky, the whole class, you can feel like now I'm in Brazil, mm -hmm. Some of the talks I have given, some of the gatherings, you can feel it in the room. It is almost like an energy source that people feel so excited to be there. And for me, it is humbling to know that I can maybe throw out some ideas that will be attractive or different to people that they will say, huh, I try that here in Brazil. I try this at my school. This inspires me as I have been inspired by others in my life. So it's giving back a little bit to the to the to the world. Yeah, that's very good, huh? I think. <laughs> I hope. Uh, one of your uh, speech, you, you said that the key is to learn, to continue to learn, and uh, how we can continue to learn uh, as we get older, because then uh, the technology is changed so, so fast. How we can uh, continue to learn uh, everything? Then now is too much information. How we can do it? Well, sometimes this is an, a, a wrong mental model. So for example, some of my students last year, when they are writing the evaluations, they said, some of the materials that you are presenting are older. And yeah. you know, maybe the year 2000, even 1999, and they say mm -hmm. now it is 2018, yes. we must need new uh, uh, books, new articles, and so forth. But I say to them, when we had our meeting uh, of, of the teachers to make the course better for next year, I say, wait a minute, let's not get wrapped up in this. For example, how old is the Bible? And the Bible mm -hmm. has done pretty good. We don't need a new Bible tomorrow. No. The old one does pretty good. And some of the articles that I give in class, one is called, um, Who is, What is the Leader Anyway? by John Cotter. He's mm -hmm. one of the gurus in leadership. Mm -hmm. That article is so beautifully written, I wouldn't change a word. But it was written uh, maybe 18 years ago. But it is as important today as it is, uh, as it was then. And Senge, you, I've talked a lot about Peter Senge from MIT. He's kind of a mentor of mine. When I read his books and the way he thinks, he has integrated some older concepts into newer ones. Even though they are, again, maybe 18 years old, they are as relevant today as they were back then. So um, I think maybe it's a slight mental model that technology is changing so quickly, we have to go with it and it's impossible. I say, time out, <sighs> take a deep breath. And, and some of the older stuff is great. Mm -hmm. And of course we want to keep up with the newer stuff. Yeah. And it's a battle, but we, we can do it. Okay, yeah. So uh, let's uh, have a break. And uh, when we come back, we, let's talk about Peter Seng. Yes, yeah? okay. <laughs> Então, combinado lá em casa amanhã depois do trabalho? Cara, amanhã não vai dar. Amanhã é meu dia de sofrer um acidente. Vai já? É. A pedra dos meril vai soltar e esmagar meu olho esquerdo. Vou ficar te devendo. Programa Trabalho Seguro. A prevenção é o melhor caminho. Era uma vez uma garrafa PET. 
Veio a reciclagem e a transformou em tecido, vassouras, madeira plástica e até casco de barco. Você tem um papel importante nessa história. Colocar os plásticos, papéis, vidros e metais no lixo seco. Separados dos restos de alimentos e outros materiais orgânicos no lixo úmido. Isso facilita o trabalho dos catadores, gera empregos e poupa recursos naturais. Mude de atitude, separe o lixo e acerte na lata. Governo Federal. Eu estou aqui para te apresentar a Unipar Social. Você sabia que a Universidade Paranaense é uma instituição comprometida também com a comunidade externa? É isso mesmo. Além de oferecer todo o suporte necessário para os seus alunos, ela investe todos os anos em mais de 300 projetos que beneficiam cerca de um milhão de pessoas, direta e indiretamente no seu raio de influência. E eu tenho mais uma boa notícia para te dar. Agora você fica por dentro de todas essas ações acessando o site social.unipar.br. Unipar Social, transformando projetos em benefícios. Capacitar profissionais para atuação no campo da biotecnologia agrária. Esse é o compromisso do mestrado e doutorado em Biotecnologia Aplicada à Agricultura da Universidade Paranaense. Recomendado pela CAPES. Com moderna infraestrutura e corpo docente com formação internacional, o mestrado em Biotecnologia Aplicada à Agricultura da Unipar prepara os melhores mestres e doutores para o mercado de trabalho. Venha fazer parte desta equipe de sucesso. Unipar, um espaço para o seu talento. Hello people again. So let's back when we uh, uh, stop the last time. Peter, you, you said that one of the good mentors of you is Peter Seng. Yes. And he's published, uh, he published uh, a book very famous about five disciplines. And you like the, the, very much this kind of thinking. Could you please give one, uh, um, one example for, or, or explain, explain for us these uh, five disciplines? Well, you know, it, it's very interesting because in the United States you have Stephen Covey who has a book called The Seven Habits. Okay. And the title of the book is The Seven Habits. Mm -hmm. So you think even before you read it, there are seven habits, all are equal, all are the same. But you look at the title of Peter Senge's book, and it's called uh, The Fifth Discipline. Yeah. So you know there are five, but maybe one is more different or more important than the other four. And what it turns out is when you do the reading, it incorporates all of the other disciplines into systems thinking. When, when Peter used the word discipline, he used it not like you are angry at a dog or a cat or a kid. Uh, he uses it from the Greek word disciplina, which means to learn. And the five disciplines that he has all come in to make systems thinking work. You need all the four other elements to make systems thinking work. Mm -hmm. Systems thinking It embraces um, the connections between people and things in an organization, about the interactions and about how we connect. Um, it's a fascinating way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's difficult in a way because like the quality movement uh, began, everyone took what we call the low-hanging fruit and were willing to do the more difficult work and quality began to disappear from the American landscape. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the same is true with systems thinking. My friends, who are really good systems thinkers, they are so frustrated that people won't embrace this. And what I do in my classroom is I ask every student to come in with what I call a chronic problem or a chronic issue. Mm -hmm. When I say chronic, I mean something that you think you have solved, and it's gone, it's away. And for funny reasons, it comes in six months later, the same thing. So the reason is, a lot of time, because we are all so busy, we try for the quick fix. We put a Band-Aid on the, on the wound. Yes. And it doesn't feel OK. My hand is fine. The Band-Aid is there. Mm -hmm. But guess what happens? Over time, the Band-Aid comes off, yeah. and the same sore is still there. So systems thinking goes beyond the quick fix. Mm -hmm. It looks at all the variables that help create the chronic problem. 
It, it looks at all the unintended consequences that the quick fix causes. And then it leads us to a place where we can choose a fundamental choice, something that will stick and stay, that maybe it isn't even the wound, maybe it isn't even in the hand, maybe it is in the other elbow that hurts that will take care of the problem. The problem is it's very counterintuitive because it takes time to do. And, and in this world, as you said before, things happen so quickly. So to convince my friends, my students, my business people, you have to slow it down, they say, yeah, OK, we will. But no, they don't. <laughs> well, as you said about uh, quick fi uh, fixing, uh, uh, kind of system of thinking. And could you give more a broader example, of, for example, how it, OK, we have a quick fixing. What are you going to do in the next step then? Well, so what we try to teach is, is do, not dis, do not get disappointed about the quick fix because it is important. Mm -hmm. I use one example sometimes about starvation in an African country. And the quick fix is we send in the food. And when we think just about this, the problem of starvation and sending in the food, well, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Food gets there very quickly. People who maybe are dying get the food at the right time and they become better and they're alive. But there are also some unintended consequences. And you say, how could there be unintended consequences? This is a wonderful humanitarian act. But what happens is the food comes in from, other, from donor nations and it comes in for free. If you are a farmer in Somalia, you do not get any money because the food is coming in for free. The farmers say, you know, it's not worth it. This is, like, again, yet another drought or another problem. They go work in the city. So the next time, there are fewer farmers. Um, so with this lovely humanitarian act, we have unintended consequences that we hadn't anticipated. Yeah. So this brings us then to what would be the fundamental choice. What could we do so the problem goes away and stays away? And in my class, no one is from agriculture, like, like Brazil, they could be. Um, but they think, they say, well, maybe, maybe we need a new irrigation system, makes better water. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need experts from Israel or from the United States to come and teach us. Maybe we need a new government that is not corrupt, that is taking away all the money. And so I, I say to them at the end, OK, this is good. You come up with some good ideas, even though you are not in the agricultural field. But I have a question for you. If this is true, why then will we see this problem again in six months? And the answer always, because this is what we call an archetype or a common story, the answer is always about the leadership. Can we provide the correct resources that we require in terms of time, people, and money? And this is the work of the leader that is not on the front page of the news. It is in the shadow. But the leader must commit to, to changing a system. On the one hand, it's great, because leaders love to live in the world of change. On the other hand, it's difficult, because if you have corruption, <laughs> if you have lazy people, if you have people who know that the rest of the world is going to save you when you have a crisis, you are not motivated to do the change that is necessary. So even though I love the subject, and my friends, from formerly from Peter Senge's company, yes more in love with the subject, we are all very frustrated that the world will not slow down enough to embrace this as a different way of thinking. Those that do succeed. And that's the wonderful part. I was in my class one time last year, and at the break, my secretary says, there's someone here to see you. Oh. And the man looks at me, and at first he is, he is angry. I'm, I think I am in trouble. <laughs> he says, Jerry, yeah. I took your course last year. You gave me a bad mark for my systems thinking paper. And you yes. said, do it again. And I was angry. But I did it again, and you gave me a good grade. Two weeks ago, we were having a difficult problem in my company. And I said, this is easy. We, we apply systems thinking. I spent a couple of hours on it. I presented to the CEO. The problem is solved. And I got a raise and more compensation. So I felt very good. I felt very happy. And then, of course, I, I needed 10% compensation for my work. <laughs> but it does work. It just takes time.
Yeah, so uh, you are also a businessman, no? Yeah. Uh, you work at a lot of uh, uh, companies. Uh, I heard about the uh, phosphorus, about uh, needles, about uh, <laughs> uh, propanol. That's uh, right. good, good memory. <laughs> yeah. But how, uh, one good uh, example that you, you said about the phosphorus. Uh, how you get, uh, because there's cartel, you, you should not have a cartel in the in, in, uh, United States. But one good thing, because the, the fossil is one research that's going to be as a, as a mineral, is going to deplete in, in, with the time. That's right. And, and you, you, you sell very well the fossil, as you are not expertise in phosphorus. <laughs> but uh, could you please give me more in, uh, insight of this kind of issue, like now how to sell things? Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> I've been joking for the last couple of days that I am here that I'm a successful businessman because I'm very good looking. <laughs> and uh, when I get home, my wife says, you're OK, but you're not that good looking. Um, so it, it's about learning. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that I learned, ODR, yes. is there is marketing and there is selling. Yeah. And I think when I began my career, I tried to sell. And people maybe buy, maybe they don't buy. But the difference between marketing and selling is selling starts with a product. Here we have a product, it's great. Here are all the, the specifications and blah, blah, blah. Marketing begins with a customer. And the reason that we became successful both in Latin America and in China is because finally we, we stop pretending we are so good looking. We stop pretending we are the greatest salespeople in the world. And we say to the customer, tell me truly, what do you want? What do you need? And in terms of um, some of the products we send, they said, in, in Central America, for example, we, we can't use the product in a drum because the farmers don't know how to store it, they don't know how to take it. But if you put that product in a backpack, the herbicide for rice that we used to sell, mm -hmm. they can take it right off the truck and use it in the fields immediately. So I got my answer, not from my own people or my own company, but from the farmers, my customers. So again, the difference between marketing and selling is selling starts with a product Marketing starts with a customer. And even the teachers here at this school, they have to understand, in terms of marketing, our customers are our students. We, we, ha we can't bow down to them and say, we're going to do everything you ask. Mm -hmm. But we have to, why are you in school? What do you expect to get out of this course? Uh, you're a graduate student. Why would you come back to school? Find out those answers. Then you can create your syllabus. Then you can create your course and meet their needs. Oh, that, that's great. Uh, we have to improve the, the, the sales, the, the quality, the susten sustainability. Everything we have to improve. Our, actually, everything to our, uh, improve our quality of life. Yes. And that's the, the key of things. That is the key of things. So uh, I'm glad that you are here. I hope that you enjoy. And we are uh, having a couple of days uh, still here in, in Paraná State. And uh, everybody's glad with you. And uh, I thank you very much for your kindness, for your time, and uh, for you coming here to your very excited uh, <laughs> person. Uh, and uh, we can have a good time here yet, yet. And thank you very much. And thanks for uh, the audience to, to, to listen and see us. And uh, until next time, and see you. Thank you very much. It has been yeah. a pleasure. <laughs>